Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to uh, 65% shortly. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance three nautical miles. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. minute 15 seconds velocity 2900 feet per second altitude 9 nautical miles downrange distance 7 nautical miles and the trail of smoke began half an hour after the explosion a serpentine trail of white smoke still twisted by the upper wind a complete evaluation going on here and at headquarters in Washington, D.C. Aside from that, Tom, we have no further information for you. All over the country. And it is just a simple fact that we identify with these people as special people, uh, even though we had come to take for granted uh, the remarkable feats that they accomplish on a regular basis. This, the 25th launch of a space shuttle and the first one to have anything like this happen to it. Uh, an obvious, uh, terrible accident in air, an explosion less than two minutes after liftoff, after NASA officials had said the liftoff appeared to be completely normal, no indication of any trouble of any kind. While we go on, by the way, we hope that someone behind the scenes is listening very hard to Mission Control in Houston and can up. We haven't heard anything from them in the last few minutes. I, th they are very quiet, I am told at the moment, but it behooves us, I think, not to write off these seven people until we're told so by, by mission control. I was thinking of the president because it was he who made this determination that we'd have a teacher in space because uh, the teacher was so symbolic of the aspirations of Americans in general. I think the president must take in this very hard. After that, in addition to finding out what happened, what do they do to fix it? The only time before in the whole history of the space program that astronauts have ever been killed in the line of duty was back on what they call Apollo 1. And at that time, the spacecraft was on the launch pad. It was an early version of the Apollo spacecraft, which called for a total redesign. Now, obviously, the space shuttle, having flown a number of times and flown very well, experienced something strange, something that caused catastrophe. Among the reporters here, uh, there was a mood, uh, it was uh, incredible. They were gathered for a news conference that should be taking place in about a half hour, a climatic news conference that should have covered all the wonderful things that an unmanned probe had discovered in deep space out on a far planet. Instead, as they watched in utter amazement on their monitors, the reporters saw instead catastrophe at the Cape, an explosion the size of a small nuclear weapon, we are told, because that's about the explosive capability of the external fuel tank when it blows. A small nuclear weapon, in space, of course, in actually in atmosphere, but high enough that uh, no one was there to observe it. Enough miles from the Cape that they could see it, but not feel the power of that detonation. There was one chute that was seen, but the observers also know there were no chutes for the crew. No chutes, no escape tower, no way out for this kind of failure. Instead, the only chutes on board were to bring down uh, the solid rocket boosters. And one of them did indeed deploy, and presumably there's a solid rocket booster somewhat burned out somewhere out there in the Atlantic Ocean. But as far as the crew is concerned at this writing, it would seem totally hopeless, and NASA obviously has suffered a tremendous tragedy with the catastrophic failure today. Tom? Right, wouldn't you think that the shuttle program now is just going to be on hold for an undetermined number of months? They've had a number of difficulties with the launch of this uh, vehicle before today because of not just weather, but they had problems even with the door handle yesterday. Don't you think that there probably will be a congressional demand and a public demand that the shuttle go on hold for a while until they get it absolutely trouble-free? I would think, Tom, were you and I running the program, that's exactly what we'd do. Settle back, figure it out, 
determine what has to be done, then do it, and then start all over again. I don't know how deeply this accident will impact the program. I think that remains to be... That seen. is not the liftoff. That is the subsequent tragic result as something blows up about 7 to 10 miles uh, above the Atlantic Ocean across the Cape. I must tell you, Steve, having now seen that four or five times, that great ball of fire looks to me like it may be one of the solid rocket boosters. The enormous power, two and a half million pounds of thrust, that is all a part of that launch that we have come to take so for granted. Uh, and that, of course, was the mix that uh, we just saw exploding once again in that replay of what took place at uh, shortly after 11.39 launch time, Eastern time this morning. The Space Shuttle Challenger with its crew of seven we do not have any official word yet on the fate of the seven crew members. Uh, two women actually aboard, Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher from New Hampshire, but also Judy Resnick, who was one of the mission specialists who had already logged 144 hours in space. From the Cape. Space shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. towards 2,000 miles an hour. This 1,977 miles per hour, 10.4 miles up, 8 miles out at the time of the explosion. And you are seeing that in slow motion, by the way, now. This the first in-flight disaster for the U.S. space program in 56 manned missions going back to the original Shepard flight. Steve, would you tell someone in our control room they have a key open that we're hearing everything that's going on in the building? Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. Once again, for those of you who have just joined us, there has been a disaster on the launch of the Space Shuttle uh, Challenger with its seven-man crew. The uh, shuttle exploding uh, one minute, 15 seconds after launch from Cape Canaveral this morning. There had been a delay, one caused by a faulty gauge. There had also been a delay that uh, was caused by ice forming on the pad because the temperature was 24 degrees this morning at Cape Canaveral. No indication that that had anything to do with the uh, enormous explosion that took place as the shuttle was just reaching that maximum period of thrust in what had appeared to be an extremely normal uh, launch. There was the normal excitement in the voice of mission control and then in the almost detached voice reading off the various numbers on what appeared to be a picture-perfect launch but then was interrupted by this devastating explosion. Steve, it is only now, 33 minutes after noon in the east, that all of the rescue teams are being allowed into what we will call the search area uh, for the moment because there was so much debris raining down from 10 miles up above uh, that NASA feared for the safety of those people going to look for survivors, principally, is what they've got to look for. Um, so only now, about uh, 35 minutes uh, after noon in the east, are people getting into the area to begin to search those waters of the Atlantic, which we have seen so desolate this morning. And we might remind uh, our viewers that while the earliest uh, shuttles did have an escape capsule, the present ones have no particular escape mechanisms whatsoever. 
the capsule is its own entity. It is that, it is that point in a mission uh, well, where while the concern is immensely high at all times and you're beginning to push out towards orbit there, uh, you're not as concerned. You'll recall in, in many of the space programs, the great concern has been for people on the launching pad. Uh, back in 1967 when Gus Grissom, among others, was uh, killed when, it, uh, when the uh, Apollo blew up on, on the launching pad. Of course, it's back there that the uh, main engines are located. And that's well, that's where all the energy was being burned. And, and um, I think I heard somebody from the, from the mission control in Houston say a few minutes ago that it was just after the three main engines to burn that this happened and absolutely without warning there was no anomaly as they say there was no indication here or from the things that the controllers were saying that anything was happening other than a great dramatic beautiful liftoff as we've seen so many times before can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on there right now in terms of the crowd are people sticking around that it's always a big attraction in florida of course but uh, a tragedy of this scope uh, you know, are people staying down around down. to hear what the final answer is, or are they just drifting away, Steve? Well, as, as usually happens, there was a, a tremendous number in the, the yellow tent back there that you may be able to see. There's a, a VIP section. There were eight or ten busloads of people who had been invited here to watch this. Some of them were uh, educators. Some of them were people with a special interest in, in either the hardware they were carrying along or something else. Um, as soon as this happened, of course, we all got so busy that, that we didn't really notice what happened to them, but they're not here. Um, reporters began to scuttle around in various directions trying to first of all comprehend what had happened and then see what what if anything we could we could do to help other people understand what was going on. Uh, Steve and Tom. What happened to the spectators I don't know. Okay yes John Palmer in New York. Uh, yeah we're hearing now from uh, NASA they say that the rescue teams are just now being allowed to enter the impact zone and the new coordinates we have of the impact zone here are 10.4 miles uprange 8 miles out over the ocean uh, where the uh, the uh, the impact uh, occurred. They say they're just now being allowed into the area because uh, for some minutes uh, after the impact there was a lot of debris some of it we saw there in that replay of the explosion falling out of the sky and it would be just too dangerous to to get into that particular area but again uh, of course we have no word on the fate but it, uh, of the crew but it doesn't look very good there were what uh, three Coast Guard cutters John I'm told and two helicopters in that area that's right and they're just now it's uh, about one hour after the explosion one hour and a couple of minutes maybe that they're finally able to enter that area but as you say debris continues to fall into the ocean there uh, there's been no indication whatsoever from NASA of any sign of life we uh, continue to point out to you we have no confirmation of course that the seven-person crew was killed but the fact of the matter is uh, if you looked at those pictures as we did, it seemed that no one could possibly survive that. Fred Francis is at the de Defense Department this morning. And Fred, what do they uh, have out there in terms of uh, rescue vehicles and rescue uh, ships? Well, Tom, this has become so routine that they just had three Coast Guard cutters out there this morning, uh, only one assigned to actually patrol up and down and uh, keep spectators away from the, the launch area just off the coast. Uh, but, of course, as soon as it happened, the United States Navy began moving its ships. And right now we're told that a U.S. Navy hydrofoil, the USS Pegasus, is about uh, 30 minutes from the scene and heading full speed in that direction along with the uh, U.S. Navy frigate, the USS Underwood and, uh, and that's about an hour and 20 minutes away. But Tom, I must tell you that within seconds of uh, watching that explosion here at the Pentagon with uh, several Air Force officers, they did not know what happened but they were very certain that, that the devastation of the explosion, one man said, nobody survived that. So what they're going to do now is actually look for pieces, uh, pick up all the pieces that are possible in that area. And, uh, and as, as we saw it shower down, it's going to be quite a wide area of, of picking up debris. Possible to say exactly what caused the explosion this morning. No one can say what caused the explosion. And the National Aeronautics and Space Administration seems to be uh, puzzled at this moment as to what could have caused it. We have it. a report from the flight dynamics officer that... This is the slow motion, a slow motion replay of the accident. And watch this now. This is slow motion replay of the accident indicates what happened. You can see a small explosion apparently on the right side of one of the solid rocket boosters. Awful as it is. Let us take this videotape, if you will, and control back to the beginning because with what little we know about this story, it may be important that people understand what you can see and what you can't see. And we're going to show you in slow motion why it's now, as we take a close look at it, you can tell what happened. Now, this is normal motion. Now, close up, you see. Now, you, 
That's normal motion. Now let's take slow motion coming back and, and watch the right side of one of those solid rocket boosters. And you'll see that the explosion apparently started on the right side of one of the solid rocket boosters. And then a few seconds later, the main huge explosion and fireball that just obliterated the Challenger. Let's take it in slow motion here if we may. These are the solid rocket boosters. And now when we see it in slow motion, we can clearly see the explosion happen on the right side, first on the right side of one of those solid rocket boosters. And then there was the major explosion. Now let's take a look at the slow motion replay. See the Challenger riding as it's supposed to. Then that small explosion on the right side of one of the uh, solid rocket boosters. Followed by the greater and main explosion. All of this happening a minute and 12 seconds into this morning's uh, launch. The 56, 56 times NASA has put a man, uh, at least one human, into space. Now, on the, on the upper right-hand side, pardon me for interrupting, but you can now see this is, is terrifying and fascinating as you see the slow motion. Look at your picture, upper right-hand quadrant. That is one of the solid rocket boosters blown apart uh, from the space shuttle as the space shuttle, its main fuel tank, and the shuttle itself and the other solid rocket booster uh, are completely obliterated. And you can see, uh, emphasize again, that in the slow motion that the first explosion occurred on the right-hand side of one of those solid rocket boosters. And as Bruce Hall uh, said earlier, there was a hard freeze in Florida this morning. Uh, and one of the theories, underscore, italicize, all caps, one of the theories is that perhaps uh, some icicles formed with a hard freeze coming off the, uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger uh, may have caused the explosion in and that tank, and they completely immersed themselves in each other and instantaneously exploded. That's a booster there, isn't it, Gene? That's a booster. That is one of the solid boosters without guidance, obviously just heading a miss. And it's going to just, there appears to be both solid boosters are broken away and don't know where they're going, but there is no signal to shut them down. And indeed, they were not designed to be shut down because there was no need to anyway. Gene, and if, stand by for just a second, would you? And, and we're very grateful for your, for your explanation about this extraordinarily sad accident. We are going to see now, uh, we're going to go now to a tape from earlier in the day uh, when Steve Nesbitt narrated all that NASA knew in the minutes after the explosion, all that NASA knew about what happened. Let's listen to that now. Uh, we did have uh, this morning at uh, uh, launch time. Launch time was approximately at 10.38 uh, central time. Uh, on launch, approximately a minute or so after uh, tower clear, there was an apparent explosion of uh, the orbiter. At the time... Um, Appears from looking at this that these are relatively small pieces. This is a very large the shuttle is very large along with the solid rocket boosters. And what we are able to see in the ocean itself appear to be quite small pieces, relatively speaking. Somewhat similar to what you have seen as the results of a number of plane crashes when there has been a an explosion and there's just very little left. Uh, we do want to point out that these are live pictures from the recovery area, which is a sh short distance uh, east of the United States mainland off Florida. Since the explosion aboard Space Shuttle Challenger uh, happened this morning only a minute and 12 seconds into flight, uh, and given the tr size, the huge fireball, one is not surprised to see so little debris uh, uh, in the, the water there. Bruce, it may be worth that we've had uh, some questions. Uh, clearly, anything as uh, complicated as one of these space shuttle launches uh, about uh, what could have happened there. Uh, perhaps what uh, we should do is, again, uh, talk about at what stage the space shuttle Challenger this morning was in uh, during uh, the launch and the, the liftoff uh, and, and what appears to have happened. Now, what we will try to do is, uh, do you have a, a model there, Bruce, or not? Dan, I do not have a model here in front of me. I think well, I'll have one here in a couple of uh, minutes. Those well, help me as we go. Have been using right. Momentous explosion less than two minutes into the flight of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Krista McAuliffe uh, has been asked countless times uh, why it was that she applied and why she went into the space program. And 
This was her answer. I'm well, sure they're excited. <laughs> why in the beginning uh, did you want to be one of the teachers who applied for the program and fly in the space shuttle? Well, it was a challenge, and it was something that I always ask my students, you know, to go and seek whatever they feel they can do and reach a little higher. Um, the whole process was kind of exciting for me because I knew that there would be people from each state who would be coming together and I thought what a wonderful opportunity to talk with all these educators and ex exchange ideas and, and that was really fun and, and that's basically why I decided to send in that application, never dreaming that it would get this far. Were you a fan of the were you a fan of the space program? Well, she certainly was. In fact, listen to her kids uh, over the last uh, few days talk about her, because we've all been up there in New Hampshire, right, Wally? Uh, I think we should make one point very clear here, that, that the attention that invariably falls on Krista McAuliffe today is in no way a reflection of how sadly I'm sure the nation feels about the other six crew members on board. 1984 re-election campaign when he said that a teacher yes. was going to be in space, she has attracted an enormous amount of attention. One of the th most impressive things listening to her students is how she managed to take in her classroom theory and practicality. Challenger, go and throttle up. There is the explosion. We have no indication at this hour of the fate of the uh, the six uh, crew members along with uh, Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher who is taking this flight. This is the first failure of this kind in 56 U.S. man in space missions. There you can see the contorted configuration of the contrails. One of them is the capsule itself. The other, we think, is the solid rocket booster. The awful Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to uh, 65% shortly. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Engines throttling up. Three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity 2,900 feet per second. Altitude 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance 7 nautical miles. The explosion has occurred. And recover and make sense of what happened this morning. The pieces, they say, have still been raining down from the sky. They came from a long way up. The smaller ones, the ones that are made basically out of scrap sheet metal. The heavier pieces, they gave us an impact time and point a long while back. Not very, they, the, the, in fact, the heavier pieces, Tom, seemed to come down almost as fast as they went up, which was quite fast indeed. NASA does have a helicopter, which is part of the coverage pattern that they have for showing us the pictures of the launch early on, and that, that camera is now out over the search area taking a look, and there's just an awful lot of blank space out there, and the chances of finding anything that, uh, that would end, the, the tune up the hearts of people who are worried about the crew are, are pretty remote. But, uh, yes, Tom, it just, it just seems that whatever started so well, I mean, the, the luck tends to go in cycles, and they'd had a run of bad luck, and the run of delays for sometimes seemed seemingly silly reasons, but this morning, everything looked so well that, that a slow-motion replay of the video in the area, very little debris spotted. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration still has no explanation. Uh, it's put forward not even any theories as to what it believes may have happened this morning. Bruce Hall mentioned that many veteran observers uh, uh, put forward the hypothesis, nothing more than that, uh, that because of the deep freeze in Florida, unusual for Florida, the deep freeze this morning, that some icicles could have been, may have been, possibly have been created, and that one theory, nothing more than that, is that the icicles uh, could have uh, in some way uh, been knocked off the space shuttle as it was uh, going up and was knocked into to the uh, explosive fuel on which the shuttle was riding.
We're told that First Lady Nancy Reagan was watching the launch alone in the White House this morning in the family quarters, and that she exclaimed, oh my God, no, when she saw that fireball that we showed you. David Martin, our Pentagon correspondent, is at the Defense Department at the moment with details about uh, the recovery operation. David? Dan, the recovery operation is being run by the Coast Guard, which had two uh, cutters in the area at the time. There were no U.S. Navy ships in the immediate area. You have the two Coast Guard cutters, a third cutter that is uh, close to the area, all three of them converging on the, uh, the site of where this uh, debris has rained down. There is a report, and we cannot confirm it uh, from here yet, that uh, the actual recovery operation was delayed somewhat uh, to stay out of the area while all this debris rained down. And to the entire space program after this tragedy, uh, perhaps a natural reaction after watching the tragedy here live. ABC News is now being told by a member of a contingency rescue team, uh, these are men trained to recover the remains uh, of a spacecraft in case of an accident like this one. He told us that if indeed uh, there was an explosion of that force and that magnitude, uh, there would be nothing left to recover. Officially, again, NASA has not even confirmed, uh, has confirmed nothing. They're only saying that there has been an apparent explosion. watching today at Cape Canaveral. You could hear the NASA commentator in the background say there's a major malfunction. Now I think it is beginning to dawn on them that something terribly is wrong. You can hear another NASA official in the background saying, let's get out of this area. Uh, Voyagers were Francis Dick Scobie, Air Force Major 46, born in Washington State, was the commander. Michael Smith, who was the pilot, age 40, U.S. Navy, born in Moorhead City, North Carolina. Judy Resnick, astronaut, 36 years old, Ph.D., born in Akron, Ohio. All of these members of the crew. Ronald McNair, another Ph.D., 35 years old, born in Lake City, South Carolina. Ellison Onizuka, major U.S. Air Force, 39 years old, born in Hawaii. And 41-year-old, Gregory Jorvis, born in Detroit, crew member, and then the special passenger aboard this Space Shuttle Challenger, Krista McAuliffe, 37 years old, school teacher, mother out of Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, we're called together at the school this morning to watch the launch. They watched and applauded as the uh, launch got off, noting that Bruce Hall said later that uh, close observers of the launch thought that uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger was getting up a little slower this morning than was usual for such launches. But of course, those school children had no way of knowing that, and they applauded uh, as the Space Shuttle Challenger seemed to get off all right, and then they watched in horror uh, as in doing the live shot of the takeoff as that uh, big fireball appeared, and it was clear that something went wrong. Correspondent Eric Ingberg reports now that an inquiry panel is to be established to investigate the cause of today's accident as per standard NASA procedures. The makeup of the panel, when it will start its work, still being evaluated. Of course, as uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration tries to figure out not only what happened this morning, you can see in the videotape, uh, both the real-time videotape and the slow-motion videotape, some of what happened, but of course what NASA wants to know is why it happened. This is the first time there's been such a design animation showing how the launch should have gone. At two minutes into the flight, the shuttle's two boosters, the solid rocket boosters, should separate uh, from the spacecraft itself. That would be two minutes in. The spacecraft never got to that point. The boosters would plunge uh, into the ocean after they'd done their job of helping get the spaceship into 
uh, headed toward orbit, and they'd be retrieved for further use, those solid rocket boosters. Uh, now, that's how today's launch, a space shuttle Challenger, should have gone. Instead, this is what happens, or appears to have happened. At less than two minutes into the flight, at about one minute and 12 seconds, there was an explosion. After what seemed to be an ordinary launch, the explosion seems to be on the right side of one of those solid launch uh, boosters, solid uh, rocket fuel bo boosters. Pieces of the 100-ton spacecraft began to come down into the water about 28 miles downrange from the launch site. The first explosion seemed to be in one of the solid rocket fuel boosters. The next explosion consumed the liquid fuel on which the space shuttle rides and uh, consumed the whole space shuttle, the solid rocket boosters, the liquid fuel tank, and the space shuttle itself. And the theory, although we have heard absolutely nothing from NASA about this, but the first people who were reviewing the tape, just as you have been saying, it appeared there was a possible small explosion or some type of ignition in the solid rocket booster, and then there was a major explosion in the main tank. Now, people have had the opportunity to review these tapes, to look at the slow motion as we have been doing. A second theory, and I must emphasize, Dan, this is only a theory. A second theory is... Uh, coming to the forefront now, and that is that an explosion took place first in the main engine tank, in the main tank, and it occurred right at the seam at the point where the orbiter, the space shuttle Challenger, is attached to the main fuel tank. I now have a uh, small model here with me, nothing like the larger one that you have, but if you can see uh, right in at the very point on this tank, if you can hold it, it's about to fall on this, but there is a place where the shuttle Challenger is attached to the main tank. It is the theory here, among others, that it very well could have been a seam on the main tank. It becomes available. This has been a TV-20 special report. was very happy to be on. The time they train together, they fly together, there's obviously utter shock and disbelief down at Houston today among the astronaut corps. On your mission, was the crew equipped with parachutes and were there ejection seats? No, no. Only uh, Columbia had them uh, at the beginning of the mission, just during the first, I don't remember, three or four missions. Senator Jake Garn, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you, Senator. And obviously and understandably shaking Senator Jake Garn, who knew, of course, uh, members of that crew because he had trained with NASA and had flown uh, just a couple of missions ago. Since. He is the man who is in complete charge of this and you can see them just sitting there waiting for the analysis through their computers of the computer information and the telemetry information that they were getting at the time. Behind the flight director is seated the flight operations director. He is the man that communicates with the NASA administration during these launches. Yeah, Dan, if you if you were listening to Senator Garn, as I know that you were, it does appear that what happened is, is they went to full throttle to 104 percent on those main engines at the back of the spacecraft that are fueled by that big external tank that's the orange tank that you see 560,000 pounds of oxygen and hydrogen as they push down in effect to go to full throttle as they were lifting off into their orbit they hope that appears to be the moment when everything went wrong when the explosion was longer occurred. than two feet in length and as the cameras panned the launch area earlier today, about an hour before the launch itself, you saw a lot of areas where there, there were icicles. So it is not just in a few areas where you can find the icicles. You found the icicles on the gantry around the launch pad and also right around the uh, engine area. And an ice inspection team was called to the pad. We delayed the launch, NASA delayed the launch by approximately one hour in addition to the earlier malfunction, so the launch itself went off two hours later than scheduled, but uh, it was delayed the last time as they brought in an ice inspection team to check the shuttle, to check the solid rocket boosters, to check the main fuel tank, and to, most importantly, check the gantry area right around the launch pad, where there still were, at the time of the launch, a considerable amount of ice. There, was a, there were a lot of icicles that you can see formed on the edges of the launch pad itself. The main concern, of course, is whether there was any ice on the... Second First, grade. Vice President Bush announced the backup for the flight, Barbara Morgan of McCall, Idaho.
Then, for 36-year-old Sharon Krista McCullough of Concord, New Hampshire, the dream came true. It's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. I've made nine wonderful friends over the last two weeks. And when that shuttle goes, they might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be ten souls that I'm taking with me. Like the whole business. Because I don't want to go in space because I just want to stay around my house. Husband Steve heard the news on the radio. Everybody who knows her, I think, honestly thought that, you know, there, there may have been candidates who were certainly her equal, but that there was nobody that would be superior to her. McAuliffe has already had a taste of what space flight will be like. This was a ride in a plane that simulates zero gravity. She'll now go through 114 hours of intensive training. That's, of course, a fraction of what astronauts go through, but enough so she can get along as she takes the flight and records her thoughts in a journal. What, she was asked, does she look forward to most? Seeing the Earth, seeing the perspective of the Earth, and just being able to um, see the planet. I mean, you see it in pictures, but be able to see that in reality is going to be wonderful. I do plan to go back to teaching. This is not a career, but it's an unbelievable experience. Dan Molina, NBC News, Washington. The ocean just east of the Cape Canaveral launch site. Now, for the critical moments of today's disaster, here is slow motion videotape, just before the explosion. You can see the, the, the first explosion. Hard to tell whether it happens on the main liquid tank or in the solid rocket fuel boosters. Then, the devastating wipeout explosion. One of the solid rocket fuel boosters just sticking out and, and being blown away. There it is in the upper right-hand quadrant of your screen. One of the two solid rocket fuel boosters at this stage uh, still at least partially intact, being blown away from, from that fireball. Well, we were aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger this morning. The $1.2 billion spacecraft, one of four in NASA's shuttle fleet, was destroyed, completely obliterated. Parts of the ship fell into the Atlantic about 18 miles southeast of the launch pad. ...into the flight. Here once again are those pictures. It is still very unclear at this moment what happened. As we said, there has been no official explanation, and even the experts who have viewed this tape over and over and over again are failing at this point to give a definitive word as to what could possibly have gone wrong. This just seconds after the launch of Challenger, and as you can see, the space shuttle itself there in the foreground. That big orange tank behind it is the main fuel tank. There are two solid white booster tanks attached to the main tank, as you can see at this point. They're just to help boost that shuttle aircraft off the ground. The, the big main fuel tank is all the fuel that's needed to get it up into orbit. At a certain point in the flight, all those pieces attached to the shuttle would be jettisoned. But at this point, in these first couple of minutes after takeoff, of course, they are a necessary part of the liftoff itself. But at this point, the shuttle Challenger with seven astronauts on board on what appeared to be a perfectly normal liftoff. No indication in what's called a telemetry, the, the talk between the shuttle astronauts until this particular moment. One minute, 15 seconds, seconds into the flight, an explosion. And you can hear in the background, even at this point, the NASA officials Roger at Kennedy the last words still talking as if it was a normal routine flight. However, quickly it became apparent the horror of what had happened. As I say, at this point, still no official explanation from NASA as to what had happened on that flight, and still no official explanation as to the state of health of the, the Atlantic Ocean for recovery and like reuse. You're looking very carefully at the situation. This is a videotape you're watching. Malfunction. We have no downlink. No downlink, no communications, in other words, between mission control and the shuttle. 11.39 this morning, Eastern time, in those jet blue skies over the Atlantic as debris falls towards the Atlantic 
some 10 to 18 miles from Cape Canaveral itself because it wasn't of course going straight up but down range as well and rescue crews and contingency rescue teams as they call them have now gone out into the Atlantic had to wait for officer that the vehicle has exploded flight director confirms that we are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point a certain note of what do we do next for mission control in Houston this morning I was saying that it took over an hour before the contingency recovery forces as they were called were allowed out into the Atlantic because so much debris was falling uh, from the skies not only the great boosters at the moment of launch here is the McCullough family watching their daughter go into space Those are her parents, her father, and her mother. And those, some of the school children, with their caps on. Her mother clearly weeping with pride at that point. children oh, is that, are those the at the Cape itself very much like the children who had watched at Krista McAuliffe's school in New Hampshire as described to us for minutes did not know what was happening it looked very much to us as if her parents did not know what was happening the fuel tank the left hand side of it there it goes you see the flame starting to creep and crawl over the top of that of the major fuel tank and stop it there and ignite now that is either at the base of the shuttle, just underneath the shuttle, or alongside one of the solid fuel tanks, booster tanks, that's attached to the main fuel tank. Now just hold that picture there for a moment, because I think what you're going to find out as the day progresses, as there are more uh, examinations of what could possibly have gone wrong here today at Cape Kennedy, this is going to be one of the major clues that people look at. Uh, our science specialist, Eve Savory, is with me, uh, Eve, as we look at this picture both you and I have been down to Kennedy before and watched enough of these shuttle launches that we were starting to think it was no different than that it was no different than uh, just watching a, a DC-9 take off at the airport unfortunately but let's watch this together this is the first indication that it's going that something is going wrong and as you can see as the frames of each picture move along that fire speeded up crawled across in front of the shuttle and the explosion starts to take place. Let's, uh, and I can appreciate how you know awful this is, but let's, let's, uh, if we can, now, yeah, if we can go backwards now. I want to just isolate where it started once again. All right, here we are, situation normal at this point, approximately one minute, 15 seconds after launch. They had just given the command, by the way, from the uh, ground control to the shuttle astronauts, uh, all throttles go which is a normal command given at that time to, uh, to, to ensure the full boost necessary to, to shoot this shuttle into uh, orbit. Now, Eve, you're watching this with me now. Let's advance it slowly. One of the things that they're, they're wondering about is a possible leak. That uh, main tank is full of hydrogen and oxygen, extraordinarily volatile explosive mixture, two million liters. And, uh, once, if there was such a thing as a leak, uh, there's, no one would stand a chance once it blew. It's one of the arguments, or one of the discussions that's being made uh, already today is the talk of ejection seats on board the shuttle. As you know, there was talk of this initially uh, in the shuttle program that there should be ejection seats, but on the first few flights, the astronauts came back and said, look, if anything goes wrong, there's no time to use them. Exactly. No one could possibly survive, and they're taking away room that we desperately need inside. And probably that would have been true. Probably had they had ejection seats, 
One can't see how one could have survived. Three good fuel cells, three good APUs. APUs are auxiliary power units. Engines are 65 percent. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Now he's going to tell them to go to full throttle, and that's when it happens. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. And there it was. An eerie, tragic beauty in the skies over Florida today. Tragedy of enormous proportions. Seven people killed, we believe. Their families obviously deeply affected as is the nation, as is the space program. Here it is in slow-mo. It's hard to imagine that anyone could have survived that. The only solid piece of debris we see is the solid rocket booster off to the side. There were no astronauts in that, of course. The space shuttle Challenger itself seems to have come apart. Debris fell into the ocean. Recovery uh, vessels were quickly in place, but they couldn't enter the recovery area because the debris continued to fall. They're there now. We've not heard how they're doing at this point. We do expect Senator John Glenn in the Senate gallery within oh, five minutes or so. Of course, Senator Glenn is a veteran astronaut. He was the first American to make an orbital flight of the Earth back in the early days of the space program and the Mercury capsule. Um, John Palmer is in New York with additional information for us. John? Yes, Tom. The Soviet news agency TASS has now made mention of this. Just a one line on it. The U.S. Space Shuttle Challenger exploded shortly after takeoff today. There is no comment. The Soviet Union, of course, is the only other country that has sent uh, people up into space. And the Soviet Union has, of course, reported the death of four Soviet cosmonauts. Prior to today, three uh, American uh, astronauts had lost their lives. Uh, there is this word, according to a spokesman for Lloyd's of London, all of the crew members of the shuttle flights are offered the opportunity for life insurance, uh, written by Lloyd's of London, and a spokesman for Lloyd's of London says that only, uh, only one of the astronauts, and uh, that was Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher, took advantage of that life insurance. She took out a policy of $1 million on her life. She, along with the other six members of the Space Shuttle Challenger, now presumed to have been lost. Uh, shortly after 11.30 this morning when the Space Shuttle Columbia exploded about a minute after launch from Cape Canaveral. On the flight today, carried our hopes and dreams along with them, and they'll live forever in our memories. And I guess that's the best tribute we can give to them. The, uh, our prayers, our sympathy, our condolences go out to their families and friends, and, uh, I guess that's about all we can say about them right at this time. And we cannot hear him. So I cannot tell you what they are saying, but we have waited four hours and 15 minutes to hear them, and we do not have audio from Cape Canaveral. These searches have not revealed any evidence that the crew of Challenger survived. The dedicated crew members of Challenger are Commander Francis Dick Scobie, Pilot Michael J. Smith, Mission Specialist Dr. Judy Resnick, Ellison Onizuka, and Dr. Ronald McNair. And payload specialists on board were Krista McAuliffe and Greg Jarvis. All early indications in the Launch Control Center, the Kennedy Space Center, have indicated that the launch was normal up to approximately 11.40 a.m. this morning, about a minute or so into the flight. Flight controllers in the Launch Control Center here and in the Mission Control Center in Houston were polled immediately after the explosion, reported that they did not see anything unusual up to that point. The solid rocket booster recovery ships were immediately dispatched to the area approximately 18 or so miles downrange from Kennedy, along with various Coast Guard and military ships, helicopters, and planes. 
I have taken an immediate action to form an interim investigating board to implement early activities in this tragedy. Data from all of the shuttle instrumentation, photographs, launch pad systems, hardware, cargo, ground support systems, and even notes made by any member of the launch team and flight ops team are being impounded for study. A formal board will be established by the acting administrator very, very shortly. Subsequent reports on this strategy will be made by this formal review board. I am aware and have seen the media is showing footage of the launch today from the NASA Select System. We will not speculate as to the specific cause of the explosion based on that footage. It will take all the data, careful review of that data, before we can draw any conclusions on this national tragedy. Thank you. Mr. Moore has time for just a couple of questions from each center before returning to the effort uh, in investigating this tragedy. Uh, please wait for the microphone and, uh, and, if I, and give your name and uh, your affiliation. Uh, and we'll start uh, right here with Jacqueline Bolden from Channel 6. There were some reports that the shuttle perhaps rose a little slower than in, in previous launches, and, and there seemed to be a loud noise, and then the noise kind of backed off, and then a, a rush of noise again. Did you get any reports from anyone else that this seemed different from the people who either experienced it, you know, saw it here live? I have not heard any reports at all relative to that uh, effect that you just described. None whatsoever. Okay. Um, up, up here in the third row... Michael. Oh, my name is Kevin Hamilton from WGIR in Manchester. Uh, the entire teacher in space program was designed to introduce more people, specifically youngsters, to the space program. Uh, this obviously is not the introduction you intended to make. What do you think the effect, the uh, long-term impact that this is going to have on the youngsters that you were hoping to attract? Well, I think we'll have to address that as time goes on. And again, I think uh, today, uh, the events of the day uh, makes it much too early for me to speculate on the long-term impacts. Okay, uh, Al uh, Selstead from uh, Baltimore Sun in the first row. Mr. Moore, at this time, do you have any estimate of how much liquid fuel was in the external tank at the time of the explosion and how much explosive power, say in terms of TNT, that remaining liquid f fuel might have been equal to? No, sir, not at this time. Uh, you realize what we've been doing uh, since uh, 1140 this morning is we immediately pulled our senior management together in this program and I formed an interim board to ensure that all relevant data to this event uh, would be impounded and would be made accessible to the investigative people that will go and take a look at it. I can't answer your specific questions relative to how much fuel was on board at this point in time. The board, when it's formally reported by the uh, administrator, formally formed by the acting administrator, I'm sure will go into those kinds of questions, but I can't answer it right now. Okay, we're going to take one more question here before going to uh, the Johnson Space Center for questions. Uh, here in the uh, right opposite you, um, Jackie. Peter Van Sant from CBS News. We received a call today from a member of an academic group who said he was on a uh, tour group that was at the Pad 39B on Saturday night. This group was supposed to get off the bus to take a close look at the shuttle, but was not allowed to because this caller says they were told that a derrick arm had struck one of the tanks on the shuttle and that some repair work was being done. Are you aware of this incident, and are you aware of, of any problems at all with, with, any of the, with either the external tank or the two uh, solid rocket boosters? No, we looked at that uh, on uh, Saturday. There was, there was not even in the same area that... Uh, uh, of the tank. It was a small box, a uh, heater box, that uh, had about a quarter of an inch of the uh, insulation out of five inches that, were, that was scraped. It was a very minor scrape. It was repaired, 
And everybody, all the experts in the program took a look at that, and uh, so we closed it off at that point in time. Wait, wait for the microphone. I have to have the microphone. There was no damage to any tank, or this arm did not strike any tank as far as not you Not know. to my knowledge. Okay, we're going to the uh, Johnson Space Center for questions. Uh, just a couple of questions. Yeah, this is the Johnson Space Center. We have a question from Paul Reeser, Associated Press. Yes, Mr. Moore. <clears throat> Was there uh, any debris of any description uh, recovered by the vessels, and if so, what was it? We, we do not have any detailed uh, debris reports at this point in time. That certainly is something that we're looking at, and we will be uh, impounding all the debris that uh, we recover, and we've set up plans here to store that debris so that uh, the investigating group can go in and look at that and assess that in great detail. I do not have any detailed reports right now on debris. Okay. Bruce Nichols. Mr. Moore, uh, with all the delays that you experienced last week, the delay again this week. Was there any pressure building at all to try to get this one off the ground with the pressure up there? And, and who made the final decision to go or no go? There was absolutely no pressure to get uh, this particular launch off. Uh, we have always uh, maintained that flight safety is our top priority consideration in the program. And we look at the status and readiness of the systems based on that. Uh, we thoroughly reviewed the activities uh, over the weekend and yesterday and continually reviewed the uh, status of Challenger right up until launch this morning. Uh, all of the people involved in this program, to my knowledge, felt that Challenger was quite ready to go. And uh, I made the uh, decision, along with the recommendation from the team supporting me, that we launch. Uh, we're going to the Marshall Space Flight Center for a couple of questions. Martin Burke, you Huntsville Times. Uh, can you tell me what this does to the schedule on down the line, and including the launch at Vandenberg? No, I'm not prepared to do that. What I have done is basically suspend operations for a few days till we can sit down and assess this. And, uh, you know, we're obviously not going to pick up any flight activity until we fully understand... Uh, what the circumstances were relative to this morning's launch. So in the interim, near-term time, we basically suspended operations until we get a handle on uh, uh, what our problems were this morning. Nick Miller, WAFF Television in Huntsville. What part will Marshall Space Flight Center play in the investigation since the uh, propulsion system was the responsibility of the Space Flight Center here? Well, they obviously have to play a very strong role in the uh, uh, investigating uh, what happened this morning. As you know, the space shuttle program is built around a team effort, not only involving the Marshall Center, but also the Kennedy Space Center and uh, the Johnson Space Center. Uh, all of the elements have different responsibilities, and clearly Marshall has the propulsive responsibilities on the shuttle. They will play a very dominant role, as will the other three centers I mentioned, as well as uh, any, anybody that uh, is contributing to the overall program and has some relevant information uh, to add will certainly play a part. Okay, we're moving to uh, Washington uh, for questions from NASA headquarters. Uh, Okay, there is a problem with our uh, audio circuits to Washington. Uh, we are going to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Bill Hines of the Chicago Sun-Times. Mr. Moore, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the appointment of this interim review board and said that it would be making uh, uh, statements from time to time. Uh, not to put any adverse interpretations on this, it sounds a little bit like a news blackout, and I'm wondering... If your objective is to consolidate information, what will be the point of issue of all those announcements in the future? And are other people not involved in that review board forbidden to talk? Well, let me, let me correct uh, your statement. First of all, I said that I had appointed an interim review board. That interim review board is, co is composed of the senior members of the NASA team here to take immediate actions on impounding data. The acting administrator is expected to appoint a formal review board very shortly, and it will be left up to that review board 
in order to determine its uh, progress reports in terms of their findings. What we have done here today is to move very quickly so that all relevant data could be impounded and all actions that are needed to be taken in order to preserve as much information as we can on the circumstances of this morning can be preserved. And that's the nature of the work that I've implemented today and I expect a formal board to be established uh, very, very shortly, within the next day or so, by the acting administrator. Uh, this is Roy Neal, NBC News. Jess, you've said, I believe, that future flights are temporarily frozen. The United States space program, as a result, is at a halt. Now, based on your experience, how long would you estimate that this investigation will take? Six months, a year, before you get back in business? Roy, it is, as, as you know, it is very difficult to uh, uh, estimate that time. Uh, it's going to be a function of uh, uh, what the board finds uh, were the difficulties today and what corrective actions have to be taken before we feel confident and uh, feel safe to uh, fly again. And I clearly am not in a position to speculate today uh, the length of time involved in making that determination. It will be done just as quickly as we possibly can but also as prudently as we possibly can and as thoroughly as we possibly can. One more question from JPL. Uh, Bill Hines again. I've got to follow up on that first question of mine. I understand now that there will be announcements made after the permanent board is appointed. Is that correct? There will be an announcement, I'm sure, of the members of the permanent board, yes. I believe that will be correct, and then I think that board uh, will determine uh, uh, its rate of reporting based on the progress of its findings. Okay, we're, go we're going next to, to the Washington um, NASA headquarters. I'm sorry, we didn't read that question. Uh, and while they're repairing that circuit to Washington, we'll go to the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Uh, Mark Weaver, WBAL Radio in Baltimore. Has this raised any questions about how uh, reliable the space shuttle is? Might there just be too many things that could go wrong with a vessel this complicated? Well, that question I'm sure will be uh, asked, and uh, I don't want to speculate on that at this point in time. That's certainly a logical question for somebody to ask. Ken Carroll from WDVM in Washington. Were there any unusual weather conditions aloft or any unusual weather conditions during the launch? None that uh, we observed that I recall. We did uh, uh, put up some weather balloons early this morning. We did look at uh, load conditions as we normally do, and the winds aloft uh, looked good. We didn't have any uh, exceedances as far as our load indicators are concerned, to my knowledge and uh, we thought everything was in uh, good shape for a launch this morning. Uh, Mr. Moore, I.J. Hudson from WRC-TV. Uh, has it become a problem that you have been too good in the past that the American people have seen flawlessly uh, perform missions on TV uh, almost routinely and that something like this happens all of a sudden it hits home even harder? Well, I don't, I don't know how to answer your uh, question uh, specifically. We always strive in every flight that we uh, perform to be as reliable and as safe as we possibly can and to do everything that we can to ensure that the vehicle and the systems are all ready to fly. Flight safety is our number one uh, priority in the uh, space shuttle program. And certainly when you see an event like uh, this this morning, we are going to have to do uh, uh, a very detailed assessment of the set of circumstances to try to understand uh, what occurred, and we will then, in turn, assess the impacts from that to determine where we go in the future. Uh, I think you can hear it over there. Okay, back here at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, we only have time for a couple more questions. Jay Barbary from NBC News in the front row here. Jess, uh, I would like to know if you know what happened to Challenger. Can we assume that it was consumed in the explosion? And can you tell us specifically what you know now that the recovery crew has recovered in the impact area? I have not gotten a briefing, Jay, on what's, what the recovery team has uh, found at this point in time. And I have basically uh, looked at the uh, NASA select photos and so forth that you did, and all I can say is that it appeared from those photos that there was an explosion. And that's about all I can say at this point in time. 
Okay, we have time for only one more question, and James Fisher from the Orlando Sentinel has had his hand up a uh, long time. Jess, um, I realize this is a rather forward-thinking question, but, but what is the situation with uh, the Rockwell plant about uh, the possibility for uh, ordering another shuttle? Has the assembly line been shut down? What's, what's the situation with that? Well, uh, as, as uh, we've discussed in the past, uh, we are manufacturing structural spares for an orbital system, and that manufacturing process is continuing. We are also buying spares for the, for the uh, current fleet that we have, and there is a production capability there if and when it's decided that that's the next step we want to do is to move forward and do that. So I think the bottom line answer to your question is yes, that is a possibility, that we could implement a production capability for another orbiter if that were decided to be the thing to do. Okay, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, but the crew ready. had to sit on the pad for an extra hour while NASA took a close Coming look up, at the uh, ice that formed during the night in the freezing temperatures. There was concern that some of that ice launch. could strike the shuttle the, during liftoff. Uh, water is, uh, Finally, after a detailed in ice inspection, three, the word was two, given, go one. for launch. And liftoff, liftoff from the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. It was the first launch from the newly refurbished pad 39B in more than 10 years. NASA officials say they saw no indications of any trouble or difficulty prior to the horrifying explosion. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Engines throttling up, 3 engines now at 104%. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. The explosion appeared to destroy Challenger. The solid rocket boosters emerged from the fireball, continuing to fly uncontrollably for several seconds before plunging into the Atlantic Ocean, leaving a trail of smoke. Coast Guard Lieutenant Dave Baird watched the explosion from aboard a commercial jet. Basically, it looked like it just tore itself to shreds and, and was uh, on fire. And it looked like a, a kid's uh, airplane being uh, hit by the wind, and it, it, it was a, it didn't appear that anything could have survived uh, from our vantage point. The Coast Guard immediately launched an emergency rescue effort, but all that was found were small pieces of debris scattered over a wide area. NASA officials put together an investigation team this afternoon, but gave no indication of the cause of the explosion. It will take all the data, careful review of that data, before we can draw any conclusions on this national tragedy. NASA sources say the immediate attention is being focused on what appeared to be fuel or vapors that appeared around the solid rocket boosters and the main fuel tank a second or two before the explosion. NASA bristles at suggestions that they launch the shuttle under pressure today. There was absolutely no pressure to get uh, this particular launch off. Uh, we have always uh, maintain that flight safety is our top priority. NASA officials announced this afternoon they are suspending all shuttle operations until there is some indication of the cause of the explosion. Bruce Hall, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. There was so much happiness this morning, so much excitement. The only tears were tears of joy. The parents of school teacher Krista McCullough standing proud as their daughter and the others lifted off. Lift off of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. But in just one minute and 12 seconds, all the joy and all the excitement was dead, extinguished in a flash. Maximum heartbreak, uh, torn up inside. This is the emotional part. And immediately the reporter begins to ask, what the hell went wrong? And in the small towns that surround the Space Center, America's tragedy was their personal tragedy. I saw it. I watched it. I cried. I couldn't believe it. I came outside and I said, there it goes. And I watched it go up. And then suddenly, boom. It's a great loss. The life, the knowledge, surely. There were seven victims who died today and millions of others who still live. Velocity 2,900 feet per second. 
this. I'm sad. I've cried. And I will cry again. I really will. I'm sorry. Bernard Goldberg, CBS News, Cocoa Beach, Florida. Of the solid rocket boosters, at this point, a small flame leak is already visible in between. As we roll this ahead in slow motion, another flame leak appears above about one second later. Then, scant tenths of a second later, a large clear flame, and then the last massive explosion. The Challenger enveloped in a terrible fireball over the next three seconds. Finally, just past one minute and 14 seconds, you can see one of the solid rocket boosters blown aside in the top right-hand corner of the screen, the booster shooting off away from the fireball. The seven crew members aboard Space Shuttle Challenger today were Spacecraft Commander Francis R. Dick Scobie, 46, born in Washington State. He flew combat in Vietnam. The pilot today was 40-year-old Michael Mike Smith, born in Beaufort, North Carolina, a naval aviator and test pilot who'd flown 28 different kinds of aircraft. Judith Resnick, 36, hometown Akron, Ohio, an electrical engineer who earlier became this nation's second woman in space. 35-year-old Ronald McNair, he held a doctorate from MIT. He was a scholar from Lake City, South Carolina. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Ellison Onizuka, who was from Hawaii. He was 39 and last year took part in America's first manned military space flight. 41-year-old Gregory Jarvis, a native of Detroit. He was bumped from Columbia's December flight to today's Challenger flight to make room for Congressman Bill Nelson as a congressional observer. And the seventh member of this crew was Krista Corrigan McAuliffe, the 37-year-old school teacher and mother of two from Concord, New Hampshire. About 300 Concord high school students had gathered to watch the launch of their star social studies teacher. It took a minute to realize that what they were watching was a disaster. Students were dismissed about an hour later, still no. Everybody's just like, they're all just falling apart, all the teachers and everything. I don't ever want to go there. I just, it's been proven unsafe. Afterward, the principal said guidance counselors will try to help students anguished by the tragedy. You're telling kids uh, in particular that uh, it's okay to feel uh, bad about this. It's okay to be sorrowful. It's okay to cry. McAuliffe was one of the most popular teachers at Concord High. Students followed her training every step of the way. The 37-year-old mother of two hoped to show by her example that space is a world open to anyone. One of the things that I hope to bring back into the classroom is to make that connection with the students that they too are part of history, that the space program belongs to them. We were with them on Saturday night and her little girl um, said to me, is mommy in space yet? And I said, no, not yet, pretty soon. And everybody was just so happy. Everybody was so thrilled that out of 11,000 teachers, um, Krista was the, the one that was selected. There were mostly empty streets in Concord today and deserted shops as the town began to move. I just watched it over again. It happened again. Very sad. Very sad for the family and everybody. One friend took a picture of Krista during a town celebration last summer. She picked it up just today, left with a photo and her grief. Steve Young, CBS News, Concord. Besides the symbolism of putting school teacher Krista McAuliffe aboard today's flight to be the first public citizen American civilian in space to spread the wonder and to inspire and teach the young back on Earth on live television, this Challenger mission had other goals in keeping with its reusable space plane, space truck, workhorse role. It was supposed to put up a $100 million satellite that would have become part of NASA's own shuttle communications network. It was also supposed to launch a $10 million payload to study Halley's Comet. Coming up next, Leslie Stahl has the latest on President Reagan's postponement of his State of the Union address, and Bob Simon will look at our... The disastrous end of the 25th shuttle mission, the sudden death of seven astronauts, five men and two women, including the first teacher in space. Americans once again reaching for the stars, and this time, the first time, not making it. That is why the nation's flags are at half-staff tonight. This is an ABC News special. The Shuttle, Disaster in Space. Reporting from Washington, here is Peter Jennings. 
What we're going to try to do in the next hour is to put this national tragedy in some sort of context. The nation has lost seven explorers. Ever since the manned space program began a quarter of a century ago with people like Alan Shepard and John Glenn, the astronauts, in one way or another, have seemed to belong to the nation. We do not know exactly what happened up there, 10 miles above Cape Canaveral this morning, but we will talk to other astronauts about what might have gone wrong. We certainly know what happened here on Earth. The shock and the sorrow has been truly international in scope. And so we'll talk, besides to just plain folks, to politicians, including Senator Jake Garn, who's been on the shuttle, and to James Michener, who so effectively captured the space program in his book. But we're going to begin with those who, to say it again, we have all lost. Here's ABC Stone Phillips. They were America's crew, men and women, veterans and first-timers, parents and even a classical pianist. They came from Akron and Detroit, Boston and the Carolinas. They were pilots and engineers and a teacher, and they were young. The oldest would have turned 47 in May. What they shared was a pioneer spirit a passion for adventure, and a belief that man's discoveries in space can help solve problems on Earth. Their leader was Commander Dick Scobie, age 46, making his second journey into space. He became an astronaut in 1979 after 22 years in the Air Force. He saw combat duty in Vietnam, won the Flying Cross and Distinguished Air Medal, and later, as a test pilot, logged more than 5,300 hours in dozens of experimental aircraft. Born and raised in Washington State, Scobie is survived by his wife, June, and two children. A few months ago, he returned to his high school to share his enthusiasm for space. He really wanted to interact with the kids. It was okay to talk to the adults, but his, his whole purpose of coming back was to deal with the kids and maybe give them some sort of a message or a goal. Second in command was pilot Michael Smith, a 40-year-old commander in the U.S. Navy on his first shuttle mission. Like Scobie, he had served as a pilot in Vietnam, been decorated, and gone on to train as a test pilot. He was selected as an astronaut in 1980. He was married and the father of three, and close to Senator and former astronaut Jake Garn. Well, it's very difficult for me to talk about it, because these were my friends. Mike Smith, the uh, pilot, was my mother hen the first month that I trained. They assigned him to me go to my classes and help uh, brief me. And I don't know of any time that I have been more shocked or more moved than when my first wife was killed in an automobile accident. 39-year-old Ellison Onizuka was Hawaii's first astronaut. His hometown honored him with a traditional parade before he left for astronaut training. Onizuka was also a husband and father, seen here with his two girls. Before turning astronaut, he taught at the elite Air Force Test Pilot School in California, and as chief of engineering there, was responsible for all instrumental and flight testing modifications on highly experimental jet aircraft. For Onizuka, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, the exploration of space was a way to serve man's more immediate needs. There are a lot of uh, outcomes from these projects which will affect both our society and the rest of the world. 36-year-old Judy Resnick from Akron was on her second mission. Her specialty, electrical engineering, her assignment to operate the shuttle's mechanical arm. On her first mission, she used the device successfully to help remove ice from the outside of the orbiter. It was also on that mission in 1984 when the shuttle Discovery aborted takeoff moments after the engines had been fired. Resnick later expressed confidence in the shuttle's safety systems. After it all happened, we were all very grateful that the safety features do what they're supposed to do on the orbiter. And uh, I think that the system has been designed such that anything that, that could present a problem uh, will be taken care of by these safety features. When Resnick wasn't flying, she sometimes doubled as a commentator, helping bring to life for television viewers what it was like to take off on board the shuttle. Gregory Jarvis, age 41, was a Hughes aircraft engineer on board Challenger to conduct tests on the effect of weightlessness on liquids carried in tanks. NASA hoped his experiments would provide information for the design of liquid fuel rockets. He was born in Detroit and trained as an Air Force satellite engineer. He was married but had no children. Mission specialist Ronald McNair was doing research on lasers when he was selected to become an astronaut in 1978 
Born in Lake City, South Carolina, schooled at MIT, he brought a background in physics to the shuttle program. This was his second flight. A husband and father, McNair saw space travel as a calling for himself and mankind. So I see it as something that we must do, and I see it as something that's part of man's nature to explore. And finally, the first teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe, chosen from more than 11,000 applicants for what she described as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Well, it was a challenge, and it was something that I always ask my students, you know, to go and seek whatever they feel they can do and reach a little higher. McAuliffe taught social studies in Concord, New Hampshire, and she said she wanted to bring the wonder of space to students all across the country. She'd planned to give lessons on weightlessness and life in outer space that were to be televised to millions of schoolrooms. She survived by her husband, her two children, and all the students she taught and adored in Concord. She did this to, to get people into the space program, you know, to open up people's eyes and get people more enthusiastic about it. And I know that she will hope that people take this as a bad accident, as bad accidents to occur, and just to have faith. In the end, faith is what America's space program began and grew up with, that and technology. Today, whatever it was that went wrong, it wasn't a problem of faith. Stone Phillips, ABC News. The seven men and women who flew on Challenger this morning, in some cases having flown before, and reminding us, of course, that the success of the space program has been such over the last few years. This was the 10th mission of Challenger and the 25th of the shuttle program that we have come to take its success and its safety very much for granted until today. I suppose the reminder there is that we now identify with those men and women in a much more personal way uh, than we have done almost at any point since the beginning of the space shuttle program with the exception of a woman flying for the first time or in the case of the first black astronaut in space. You saw in Stone Phillips report Senator Jake Garn from Utah who said that today's accident was so devastating to him it was clear. Senator Garn is now at Andrews Air Force Base having just got off the vice president's aircraft having flown to Cape Canaveral uh, to talk to the people at launch control and clearly to talk to the families. Senator Garn, I think I know what the mood and the atmosphere was that you found on there, but would you tell us anyway? Well, obviously it was very difficult. You always feel so inadequate. What do you say to people when they have lost their, their loved ones, and particularly where I was so personally involved and knew those that were killed today? But I was so impressed with Mrs. Scobie. She stood up and she said, we want you to know, Mr. Vice President and Senators, and I'm sure I speak for all of the families, that we want the space program to go on. We don't want this tragic accident to slow it down or stop it. And she said, we know that our loved ones would feel the same way. And so just a, a very moving and touching experience. Senator, you flew on the shuttle last April. You're an enormous supporter and very much a booster of the space program. What do you think today will do to America's program in space? Well, obviously, we can't fly again until we determine the cause of this tragic accident. But once that has been determined, we make certain that it can't happen again, then the space program should continue. We have learned so much from space. It benefits all of God's children, every place on this Earth. The basic research and development that goes on is so valuable to us, and that must continue. And I think we need to look at the fact that we flew 56 manned space missions, a remarkable safety record for this tragic accident today. So I hope that my colleagues will be smart enough to recognize the values of space flight, listen to Mrs. Scobie, and have the space program continue. Senator, we have been thinking today about why this has been such a shock to the nation. Why do you think? Probably because the space program has been so successful. John Glenn was with me today, and from his very first orbital flight, we have not lost a single American in space. And that is a remarkable record, and I suppose too many people have taken it for granted. They haven't realized that we are still in the infancy of space flight, that we still have a great deal further to go, just as in the beginning of, of general aviation after the uh, Wright brothers. And so I guess they just expected never to have an accident. We just continue going on with our magnificent success record. And, Senator, there has been today the inevitable mini-debate, I think we can say, about the value of man in space versus the value of sheer technology in space. Why should man go into space 
so well, constantly why, why in your Why should view? man have explored the West? Why should the man have crossed oceans? There is a balance that we need in space. We have the Uranus mission out. We've done a lot of unmanned space programs. But you look at what man has been able to accomplish. You look at the work that has been done in space. You look at the experimentation on medicines for the future. You look at the repair, the retrieval of satellites in space. Uh, man can do a great deal that machines can't do. And so you need a balance of the two. And we have had that, and that balance should continue using robotics and using man. Senator, I know this has been an extremely difficult day for you. I do have one last question. We were immensely frustrated waiting for NASA's briefing today and getting as little as we did. Do you think NASA will reach some kind of conclusion fairly quickly based on the data they have? I would not expect a quick conclusion to this. Uh, there is so much information. There are hundreds of channels of telemetering data that comes back that has to be analyzed. They'll have to appoint a commission to study this. And I don't think they want any quick fixes. They want to know what happened and why and how to fix it. And that is the important thing, not speed in making that determination, but make sure we make a sound determination and sound recommendations. Senator, you're very thoughtful to take the time for us when you've given so much time to the families today, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Jake Garn, a senator from Utah who uh, flew uh, on the shuttle last April and who, as we said, is a and as you can clearly see, is an enormous booster of the continuation of the American manned space program. The senator raises the question of safety and delay. Back in 1967, when the astronauts Grissom, White, and Chaffee uh, died when their spacecraft caught fire on the ground, it took 22 months before the space program was resumed, which will give you some indication of how long we might now have to wait before the manned space program, the shuttle program, uh, continues. Challenger today had flown for just a little over a minute. When it left Cape Canaveral after something of a delay, it was a little after 11.30 in the morning. Let us go back now to recall that moment which much of the nation Four, three, saw live two, and much one, of the nation shared in. Liftoff. The initial joy liftoff. and the subsequent the horror. Roger, As you can see on your screens there, it was 11.39 in the morning Eastern Standard Time after yet another delay, and Challenger's had a number of them, as has had Columbia. But it looked so perfect against the blue Atlantic sky as the rollover came. Engines beginning throttling down now. At and those big additional throttle. booster rockets in the main engine rocketed Challenger towards its orbit. Shortly. Roughly approaching 2,000 miles an hour. Engines at 65 percent. Three engines uh, running normally. Three good fuel cells. There three will be APU. a phrase here that we shall all long remember. Listen to mission control. Velocity, tell them what 20, to do. 257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Engines throttling up. Three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go with throttle up. Go, go with throttle up. And then it happened. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. And it occurred with such lightning speed as one of the booster rockets flies randomly off into space. And we look at it again in slow motion that you may have noticed that the control commander, the launch control voice that we've become so familiar with on launches, was simply reading his telemetry, his information coming back, and was not aware, as so many people were when they saw it, even though they didn't understand it in space. Lynn Schur, who covers space for us on a full-time basis. Lynn, can you pick up from your base in California and tell us now what we're seeing? Well, Peter, we've just gotten past, obviously, the critical moment. This is the fireball. This is the catastrophic explosion engulfing the Challenger and the solid rockets. And I think in just a moment, uh, you will see the uh, what we think there on the lower right of your screen appears to be Challenger's nose uh, emerging from that big cloud, um, then falling into the ocean, our last view of Challenger. Uh, we have examined these tapes so many times, Peter, that, that we think we can at least try to pinpoint the sequence. At the right of your screen now, the solid rocket booster fizzling off into nowhere. Uh, nowhere to go. It is controlled 
uh, before launch, and it's meant, of course, to be attached to the shuttle and to the tank and to take them into orbit. Uh, but with that premature explosion, it has nowhere to go, and it's off into the ocean. And if I'm not mistaken, the next few frames will show us the crazy spinning of the two solid rocket boosters forming kind of an awkward Y-shaped as they each go off in kind of a cockeyed direction, obviously not where they're meant to be going at all. Um, it, it looked to us when we have screened this tape before that the uh, first flame appeared in between the external tank and the orbiter. Now that's the plume on the left, that's a little bit of the gas uh, fuel for the fire, just, just uh, the liquid hydrogen and oxygen burning off. There is where we thought we saw uh, the first sign of flame. Uh, actually, I think it was a little bit before this. Uh, maybe we can go back and find that. In any event, this is the flame that is now going to ride up the external tank in between the tank and the orbiter, both of them extremely thin-skinned on purpose for weight reasons. They're not meant to withstand this kind of explosion, and obviously when that liquid hydrogen and oxygen gets near that kind of heat, boom, it just went in an instant. And no one I have talked to here on Earth believes that it happened in any more time than just an instant. The astronauts, the shuttle, simply did not have a chance. And in other words, to not put too fine a point on it, they didn't know it hit them. Absolutely not. I know that um, you and everybody was uh, were talking very uh, hopefully uh, for a while that perhaps those parachutes indicated they had gotten out. There really does not appear to be any way that that shuttle is simply not designed for that kind of explosion. Now, of course, the problem is what really happened. We can look at the sequence. We can pinpoint where we see the flames. What NASA has to do is figure out why. Uh, Peter, we've uh, been talking to a number of people. There are a number of theories, all of them speculation. Let me run down a few of them for you, if I may. One possibility, perhaps one of the three main engines simply let go, causing a problem that way. These engines had flown before, all three of them, one of them on three missions, one of them on four missions, the other on four missions. Perhaps something happened to an engine. Uh, another possibility, perhaps there was a problem in the fuel line connecting the tank to the shuttle Challenger. Um, maybe something happened there. Another problem, perhaps it was one of the struts, one of the connectors holding that big tank onto the shuttle. Maybe that was the problem. Uh, another possibility, a puncture in the tank. That tank, again, extremely thin-skinned, the orange tank. Maybe there was a hole, maybe there was a leak, who knows. Um, the only other possibility, and I'm sure there are millions more, the only other possibility I've heard discussed was that one of those boosters, one of those white crayon-like structures on the side, those big Roman candles, perhaps went awry before it split off. Uh, our evidence from the footage we've seen does not seem to indicate that. Again, we're not going to know until they do all the analysis. Well, Linda, Those are, again, just some of the theories. Well, I'm just saying, just by suggesting some of the theories, you've opened uh, uh, an endless range of possibilities. One of the yeah. people who's been tremendously helpful to us today joins us again now from Houston, Gene Cernan, the former Apollo astronaut, the last man to walk on the moon. Gene, you've uh, seen the same tapes over and over again today. What do they tell you? Well, Peter, you know, we can, uh, we can speculate, I guess, uh, all day long, but it does appear that something, uh, Lynn's, Lynn's ideas are certainly have, have potential, but it appears to me that uh, whatever it was, it violated the integrity of that tank uh, and allowed the liquid hydrogen and, and the uh, liquid oxygen in some capacity to mix. And hydrogen is a tremendous explosive, uh, and in this case, we saw the results of what can happen when it's mixed with something like oxygen. Well, Gene, let me offer, if I may, to you another theory, if I could get a look at this model here. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but about a year ago, the whole process was, was lightened up to some extent, and there was some suggestion today, at least by some people, that these struts, and Lynn has alluded to it, these things which basically hold the Challenger on to this enormous gas tank, which is really what it is, uh, may have not been able to stand the stress. Do you buy that theory at all? Well, of course, it's always possible, but, you know, this, the vehicle was designed to go through that area we've talked so much about today called uh, maximum dynamic pressure. That's when, the, if you will, the speed of the aircraft and the, and the density of the air create the greatest wind uh, on the spacecraft uh, during its ascent. Uh, it's, it's designed specifically as that, for that point being a high stress point uh, where you get the greatest shaking, the greatest bending of the skins, uh, the greatest flapping of the wings if you want to go to exaggeration. Uh, that's a very critical point. It appears that this either occurred just subsequent to that point. There may have been a rupture as a result of that uh, through fatigue or for some other reason. 
Gene, there has been the obvious question asked today about an escape mechanism in a space capsule or something on board the shuttle. There, there was one on Columbia some time ago. Why not on Challenger? Well, you know, the, the, the Columbia's first four flights, uh, I think the crew, it was only a two-man crew. They did have ejection seats. It was a test uh, vehicle. If we go into the history of the space program, no other manned spacecraft has been flown for the first time with a man aboard. They were all flown unmanned until we got to the space shuttle. Uh, we built ejection seats in so that the crew was able to make some decisions at different points of the missions uh, had they needed to, had they had some inkling of a problem uh, that was forthcoming. Uh, we decided when we put five and six and seven people on and the shuttle became uh, more operational, uh, proved its capability, its reliability, uh, that not only was there no need for those ejection seats, in a case like this, for instance, they would not have even done any good. There was an escape me mechanism, and that was a shuttle itself. Uh, if the crew, if the ground had some idea that there was a problem occurring, a critical problem, any even a couple moments uh, ahead of time, they could have jettisoned that external tank, jettisoned those solid rockets, and although the maneuver is very complicated and difficult, landed back at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Gene, I'd, I'd like to point out, and I know that you know this too, of course they had that capability. Uh, as you well know, nobody really ever wanted to try that. A return to the launch site abort, which is the technical name for it, that emergency landing back at the Cape. They say they were prepared for it. They didn't really ever want to try it. And, and just to add to what you were saying about the ejection seats, uh, Peter, you're quite right. Uh, there were ejection seats on Columbia. There are no longer. It has been modified uh, to match Challenger Discovery Atlantis and as Gene points out uh, there were only two ejection seats and now there's five six and seven passengers well I think the point I'm trying to get at here because it has been raised today and let me get a fairly brief answer from you if I may Gene was this a shortcut because we were putting additional personnel on the shuttle or is this a reflection of how good NASA felt about the safety of the program in general now, I, the, the program was designed to follow this, uh, this plan of attack. It was designed as a test article and a test vehicle initially to have those ejection seats. Subsequent to that, it was designed uh, uh, not to have them, and that was the plan. I, this was not a shortcut. It was just a planned and a long-term operation uh, of, of this vehicle. You know, if I might make that abort and come back to landing site, a very difficult maneuver for the best aviator in the world. But we confronted those things a lot in the past. Uh, my last launch was a night launch. Uh, if everything failed and we had to abort during the same phase of the mission and we had to get off the launch vehicle, at nighttime I had to use STAR to be able to orient the vehicle so that we could uh, head in the right direction and not burn up coming in the, in, into the atmosphere. That's something I didn't want to do, but it's something we practiced, and I think indeed I knew we could do it if we had to, and I believe that was the same in this particular case in every shuttle flight. Gene, thank you very much for joining us. You've made a wonderful contribution today, and we're very grateful you helped our understanding a lot. Gene Cernan, last man to uh, set foot on the moon, one of the Apollo astronauts uh, who has become, as we said at the beginning of this program, the nation's astronaut, one of those individuals who has been so touched. One of the things that people have said fairly regularly today is that we've become rather blasé uh, about the success of the manned space program. On the other hand, people have tended to to refer on more than one occasion to the way people chivied away at NASA because both Columbia and Challenger have spent additional time on the ground when they were supposed to be launched because of minor uh, and sometimes not so minor problems. Now, there's no question that both Columbia and Challenger, Challenger's the issue here today, was something of a trouble spacecraft. Does not suggest by any means a uh, reflection uh, on what happened today, but it was on occasion a troubled spacecraft. Here's John McQuethy. When they built this billion and a half dollar spacecraft, they projected that it would be flying for at least a decade, part of a fleet of space shuttles that would be roaring into orbit every few weeks. Challenger was on its 10th flight today in just its third year of service. Like its sister ships, Columbia, Discovery, and Atlantis, Challenger has suffered through some crippling technical problems over the years, but has also repeatedly written itself into the history books with its many successful firsts. It was aboard Challenger that Sally Ride, the first female astronaut, made her maiden voyage into space. Guyan Bluford became the first American black in space. His ship was Challenger. The spacecraft was used for the first space walk from a shuttle in 1983, and a year later it proved for the first time that shuttle could indeed capture a satellite, repair it, and send it back into orbit.
But Challenger has also been shadowed by problems. Its first launch in 1983 Altitude, was delayed miles. for two and a half months because of an engine leak. In one 1984 mission, the Challenger crew lost three satellites while trying to launch them into orbit. Malfunctions later blamed on the satellites, not on Challenger. In December of 1984, NASA had to scrub Challenger's next mission. It was supposed to carry the military's first secret payload into space. Challenger's protective heat shield had been badly damaged, and the ship had to go in for an extensive overhaul. Last July was probably Challenger's worst month until today. Three seconds before its scheduled liftoff, the countdown was stopped because of a coolant leak. We have an RSLS abort. We have an abort. Later that same month, Challenger came perilously close to disaster when it suffered what NASA called a launch emergency. One of its engines shut down while a spacecraft was climbing into orbit. The crew scrambled to jettison excess weight, but they could never get Challenger up to its full orbit. Challenger was supposed to fly five missions this year. One of them was to be a secret military payload, taking it into orbit. The military, in fact, has been so concerned about the reliability of Challenger that it has insisted that NASA fly at least two military payloads a year the old-fashioned way atop expendable rockets. That was a hedge in case the Challenger and all of the other space shuttles proved that they could not do as promised. Peter? John, thank you very much for joining us. In fact, on the four shuttles, there were 15 missions planned for 1986, both in the commercial field and the military field. Uh, this was to be a very ambitious year for the space shuttle. And as John McCreffy points out, um, and as others have pointed out, this is an enormous setback, not only for the commercial competition, uh, but also for the military program which the United States had been using the shuttle for. In a sense, we'd like to put aside for a moment now the technical dilemmas um, for today of Challenger in this particular instance and the overall program and talk about the human dimension because as as those of you all around the country must have felt, and we have been quite stunned, I must tell you, to, to hear and feel and sense the reaction from all around the world. It came from China, it came from the Soviet Union, Her Majesty the Queen in Britain, um, the National Parliament in Canada took a minute of silence. There was this quite incredible outpouring of sorrow and shock from around the world for the seven individuals on board. To talk about them a little this evening, we've invited James Michener, the author, to come onto the program from Austin, Texas, because his book, to a great many Americans, um, captured the feeling and the sense of the people in the space program. Mr. Michener, thank you for joining us. Talk to us a little bit, if you would, about the people in the space program. Uh, I received some criticism in my novel, Space, because the uh, great uh, effort that uh, I focus on at the end uh, ends in tragedy. It aborts on the moon, uh, the two great heroes are left there, and uh, one man is uh, left with a sad job of bringing the ship back home. People said, why did you have to do that? Well, I had to do it because any man with common sense uh, looking at this great program, of which I had been a part for many years, uh, knew that the capacity for what happened today was always there. It could always have happened. As a matter of fact, it did happen right at the beginning with those three wonderful young men, Grissom, White, and uh, Chafee. Uh, but the program went on. Uh, it was only uh, two years after Chafee and uh, his friends uh, died in that tragic accident that men were walking on the moon. And I think that's the lesson of today, that uh, we have lost uh, seven wonderful people one of whom was a good friend of mine. Uh, this has hit me with terrible force, uh, but only as an example of what we live with in almost everything we do. Mr. The capacity for tragedy is always there, right at the edge. And the danger, of course, is always there for people who live on the edge. The people we've talked to today, Mr. Mitchell, have often been very closely identified in a professional way with the space program. Through your research, I know you spent a great deal of time with these people. What is it about them that leads the rest of us to invest so much in them and often place so much of a burden on them as national heroes? Uh, I think with great affection of many of the astronauts I've known, and I'd like to make one point clear tonight. I've talked with them for many hours, and I have never heard the word fear mentioned. They don't sit around and brood about what would happen if I get into this crate 
and uh, something happens, they know what would happen. It's part of their lives. They've accepted that 15 years ago when they wanted to become a test pilot or wanted to become an astronaut. Uh, they live with fear uh, constantly, uh, but they do not let it dominate their lives. I have never heard an astronaut speak of fear, nor would I ever speak of fear to them. Uh, we were talking about machines. We were talking about procedures. We were talking about the inevitable chances that all men take. Uh, theirs were more grievous, I think, than some. Uh, but uh, these were young men, and I knew two of the women very well and loved them, really. They were just magnificent people. And uh, we talked about uh, the professional problems. Uh, we talked about the next flight. Uh, always there was the knowledge that this was a very difficult profession they had gone into. There was a dignity about it. Uh, there was a wonder. Uh, there was a feeling that they were on the cutting edge of life and they wouldn't have been anywhere else. Mr. Michener, I, I detect, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that what you're saying in favor of the manned space program as opposed to the purely technolo technological one as we've seen in Voyager 2 out in the mm -hmm. heavens this week is the question of judgment and touch. Is that right? If you read uh, the latter part of my uh, book, Space, uh, you will see that I pay a great deal of attention to that great debate between manned and unmanned uh, space uh, effort. I personally came down in the book slightly in favor of the unmanned, of sending the great machines out to see what they could do, uh, just as yesterday the machine at Uranus sent us back such a remarkable bit of information. However, I knew from the beginning that in the United States, the space program had to have men and women in it to uh, focalize uh, what we were doing, uh, to, to epitomize uh, what the space uh, program meant for human beings. And so I subdued my scientific bent and said, okay, if we have to do it with men uh, more than perhaps we should, uh, that's the rules of this game. And I was willing to live with it. Uh, tonight, I think you phrase it uh, very well, Peter. I, I'm absolutely 50-50. I, I see the virtues of each. Uh, I think each is necessary. And I expect to see each move forward with great triumphs uh, for the rest of this century. Mr. Michener, thank you very much for joining us this evening from Austin, Texas, and making such, as always, a thoughtful contribution. James Michener, the author in Austin, Austin Texas, making the point so many people have made today. It's one of the reasons we fly the flag at half-staff all over the nation. Here in the Capitol tonight, at the White House, and in small and large communities all over the country. Because the adventure in space without man and without Americans is clearly incompatible with the national character. When we come back, we'll talk again to one of those astronauts, Deke Slayton. We'll also have some thoughts from George Will. We'll be back in just a moment. ABC News coverage of the shuttle disaster in space continues in a moment. After this message from your local stations. Good evening, that flag at half. How the news today hit Washington like a thunderbolt. A number of us reporters were at the White House this morning waiting to see President Reagan, who usually on the morning of a State of the Union address calls in reporters from around the country, the networks and the newspapers and the wire services, to talk about his State of the Union message. And in the middle of that meeting, as we waited for the President to come into the dining room, uh, a message was handed in the door to Don Regan, the Chief of Staff, saying the shuttle has exploded, details to follow. We all fled from the room, obviously. And shortly thereafter, as some of you may know, the president canceled, postponed his State of the Union message, which will now be given a week from today. And the White House and Congress, but the White House particularly, has just felt the burden of this national tragedy um, very deeply. Here's our White House correspondent, Sam Donaldson. 
The flags went down to half-staff all over Washington as the shock set in, from the White House to Capitol Hill. This is truly a national loss. Well, it's very difficult for me to talk about it because these were my friends. The House of Representatives paused for a moment of silent prayer, and elected officials tried to make sense of what had happened. I think everyone that's ever had any connection with the program has felt that someday there would be a, a loss in flight. Uh, we're dealing with tremendous powers and speeds. You're traveling in orbit at five miles a second and trying to get back into the atmosphere from that kind of speed. And so uh, are we going to be perfect forever? I guess the answer was proven this morning that the answer to that is no. God moves in mysterious ways. I guess from time to time,